Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the ASC Research Net meeting with us. I have the great pleasure today to be here with Professor Bernd Bertiger and Professor Gavin Perkins. We are sharing this interesting sessions and we are looking ahead to a couple of very interesting talks out of the ESC Research Net. We just want to inform you about the structure of this um, one hour. So we are asking all the presenters to present a topic in five minutes and we allow two minutes of discussion after each topic immediately. So we just um, want to ask you to put your question into the Slido tool so that we can immediately after answer those questions. So I'm calling in today from Toronto, Canada and I'm quite far away, but doesn't matter. I'm happy to be here and I'm now handing over to Professor Bertiger, who's going to tell you a little bit more about this session. Okay, thank you very much, Sabine, and uh, welcome from my side to all of you. I'm an anesthesiologist and intensivist from Cologne in Germany, and I was for the last eight years the ERC Director Science and Research. And just very briefly, some few sentences on the ERC Research Net. We have started about seven and a half years ago in Krakow at resuscitation 2013. We had initially during our funding meeting 8080 members and the goal was to increase visibility of the science that is produced in Europe and under the umbrella of the European Resuscitation Council. Seven years later now we have more than 200 members within the ERC research net and I have a slight conflict of interest with this, but I would say it's a great success story. We have now 57, 57 international scientific publications with more than um, 250 impact factors produced together. We had an ERC research net summer school for young investigators meeting senior investigators for more than four years since 2017 now. And we have received European funding and European funded collaborations, um, which is also supported by the European Commission. One of these collaborations will be presented today. It's the Escape Net collaboration. Then I also would like to mention the COST consortium. And I would just like to say, this is a great network with high visibility in the meantime. According to the ERC statutes, I'm not allowed to stay in this position after eight years. And I'm very proud and very happy to further help to develop the, this uh, ERC research network together with Gavin Perkins, who is the new lead and the new person in this position. And with this, Gavin, I would like to bring the microphone and give it over to you. So th thank you very much, uh, Bernd, and um, I I'm hugely delighted uh, and thrilled at the opportunity uh, to uh, lead with the amazing European Research Resuscitation Council Research uh, Net. Uh, the legacy that you leave behind, uh, Bernd, is, is substantial, uh, and from somebody that participated in that meeting back in Krakow, to see the way that you've crafted uh, and grown the network has been you know, truly phenomenal and, and, and sets the bar very high. I think one of the things that has struck me uh, throughout my involvement with the European Resuscitation Council Research Net is that it very much is a network. Uh, and I think it's not about the, the, the vision uh, of an individual, but about the vision of a network. And I hope that over the course of the next few weeks and months, as I take up the post as the new ERC Director of Science, that I will be able to work with you to call on your collective expertise to help us uh, refresh, reinvigorate and, and sustain uh, the vision that, that Bernd has alluded to. So um, thank you, Bernd, and, and thank you, colleagues in the ERC Research Net, uh, you for the opportunity uh, ahead that I think we'll all uh, take together uh, and, and go from better to best. Thank you. Okay, I think we are now ready to go to our first presentation. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Jessica Rogers, who is the current chair of the Young ERC. And she's going to give an update on the Young ERC networking that we are doing together. Jess, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Sabine. Yeah, thank you to everyone from ResearchNet for giving me a couple of minutes to come in at the beginning of your session and steal some of your time. So Sabine said, I'm Jessica Rogers. I'm an emergency medicine registrar in the UK, but currently in Brazil. Um, and I'm the current chair of the Young ERC. So for those who might not have heard of us, we're the trainees branch of the ERC, and we're aimed at helping all trainees or anybody who's earlier on in their career to start building those networks within the ERC and getting excited and interested in resuscitation science. Um, so open to all, all healthcare disciplines, anyone at any stage really can come and join us. Um, and what we'd really like to do is link more with the researchers side. So Burns done a fantastic job and the team have done a great job of getting the researchers together into a network. So we'd like to help to expand that a bit more. So we're already on all the social media accounts um, and we're live tweeting through all the sessions with the hashtag resus21 if you want to join in any conversations with us today. Um, but we've got two things really that are aimed more at the researchers from this network. So the first is our LinkedIn page. So if you search under groups for ERC, you'll find a group that's called ERC and Young ERC. Um, that we're really, it's just getting off the ground, but we're really hoping can be a networking hub for researchers, for both junior and senior researchers, um, to use it so that they can have discussions about their research, they can interact and reach out to each other. So we'd like it to be a two-way two -way street. So if you're a senior researcher and you need some, some manpower, some, some new people to come in and help with data collection and with running your studies, then we'd hope that you could use that as a way to reach out to people. And similarly, those more junior researchers then get the experience and the time to spend with some more senior researchers learning and enhancing their careers. Um, so go and check that out, please. If you're interested in that, we'd really like to work on a kind of buddy mentoring system within, within there. Also, we run some webinars. So in our Young ERC session last year, back in October, uh, we had a really good Q&A session with Simon Carley, Ross Fisher, and a couple of our own Young ERC members, Casper and Anna, who ran a Q&A on getting started in research. Uh, on the back of that, we then wrote a 10, com 10 Commandments for Starting Research Infographic, which is available on social media as well for all those who are just dipping their toe in. Um, and we'd like to take that a bit further and offer another webinar, probably in June of this year, in the summer, that again would be a Q&A, but in a breakout rooms format. So the idea is we'd have five rooms with five experienced researchers from different backgrounds, and then 25 participants split between the rooms. They get 15 minutes per room in their group to ask some questions. And we would hope that those questions would be tailored towards that researcher. So whether that's asking about um, starting multinational trials, sitting on writing groups, uh, setting up education programs, whatever that senior researcher is interested in. It's a way, again, to just start making some more networking connections and asking your questions directly to them. So if anybody would be interested in being one of our senior researchers, we'd love that. If you send us an email, I'm going to pop the email address into the uh, chat box after I finish speaking. Send us an email and we'd love to collaborate with you on that. And then once we've got some speakers set up, we'll be in touch with everybody else um, for uh, participants to come and join us. We'll limit it for the first one. And then if it works well, we'll start trying to run them maybe a couple of times a year if they go down well. Um, we've done two webinars beforehand on uh, bridging the training gap in COVID and stress and the importance of debriefing. Both of those are still available as recordings on Facebook if you wanted to check either of those out. Uh, and we have a monthly newsletter of what the team is up to, the opportunities, any upcoming events. Um, the sign up form is pinned to the top of our social media accounts on Twitter and Facebook. So if you'd like to get in touch with us, please do through any of those channels. And that's it. Thank you for letting me have a couple of minutes and I will hand back to Sabine and the team. Okay, thank you so much, Jess. I'm not sure I can't see any questions on the Q&A uh, right now. We maybe give the people a minute. I can keep an eye on it. I'll, I'll reply directly to the, to the Q&A if anything comes through. Thank you so much. If you could do that. So I'm going to hand over back to Bern for the introduction of the next speaker. Thank you very much, Sabina and Jess, and also for all your plans and your cordial invitation, Jess. We will come back to this, I'm sure, um, on many occasions in the future. So for me, it's now a, a
great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Hanno Tan from the Academical Medical Center, um, Heart Failure Research Center, Department of Clinical and Experimental Cardiology in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, he is um, part of the Department of Cardiology there. He is the lead investigator and the person behind the Escape Net Consortium. And the Escape Net Consortium is a great, um, a, a great effort to further increase research in cardiac arrest and cardiopulmonary resuscitation in Europe. It is funded by the European Commission with 10 million euros over five years. And I would personally like to say that Hanno is one of the most prominent and famous researchers in cardiology in Europe, at least, and maybe um, also in the rest of the world. And he's one of the most friendly cardiologists I know. So Hanno, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bernd, for your very kind words. Um, it always almost makes me blush, but anyway, um, I try to um, uh, tell you, uh, and I'm very excited and, and, and grateful for the opportunity that you, uh, Bernd, and Gavin, and the ERC has given me to tell you something about the uh, uh, EscapeNet project. Um, I hope you see the screen. Um, you can see it, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, not the, yet. Uh, not yet. Maybe. Not yet. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, maybe can you, um, Francesc, can you please give the screen? All right, you know, you know what, I, I think you see it now, right? Now we see it. Thank okay, you. thank you. I'm sorry for the delay. So this is the title that I'd like to discuss with you today. Um, I have no uh, conflicts of interest. Um, and uh, so the EscapeNet project is the first of the two uh, uh, Horizon um, funded projects that I'd like to discuss today. At the very end, I will briefly touch upon the uh, a new program, the PARC program. It's a networking program because I think networking is the name of the game for, for this uh, session. But I'd like to uh, walk you very briefly through the EscapeNet project. And this is uh, the summary of the uh, aims that we set out uh, when we started this project uh, about four years ago. Um, so um, you will be familiar with uh, section B, the resuscitation science, but um, I am a cardiologist myself, so I'm also very much interested in trying to understand what causes the sudden cardiac arrest in the first place, the pathophysiology. And this is in fact uh, the other main objective of the EscapeNet project. Um, and we try to uh, uh, address both objectives. Uh, and not only do we try to uh, study them both, we try to bring them both together. Um, um, I'll come back to that in, in, a, in a minute. Um, in addition to that, of course, the, as I told you before, networking is uh, the name of the game, not only of today's session, but also of the EscapeNet project. Uh, so uh, we take great effort in trying to uh, expand the network and of course trying to uh, disseminate uh, and educate um, uh, the, the scientific community and, and the uh, care community with regards to sudden cardiac arrest across Europe and hopefully also beyond. And I'm very happy that in that uh, context, the ERC is partner in the EscapeNet project. Uh, in addition, the European Heart Rhythm Association is also partner of the project. Um, so with these uh, two professional organizations, uh, the dissemination and education efforts uh, really have uh, taken off, uh, I think. And then we also try to foster new collaborations. Uh, the summer school is something that Bernd has already uh, referred to in his uh, in introduction. And at the very end, I'll talk about briefly about the PARC project as a cost project. So the EscapeNet project uh, is a consortium which is composed of the partners which are indicated in, in, in pink in this, um, in this map. Um, and uh, together uh, we have uh, collected uh, uh, over 90,000 sudden cardiac arrest patients across uh, these countries uh, with over 14,000 DNA samples. And this is the basis from which we try to do our uh, research. We have uh, done uh, a harmonization of these networks. So we have one joint uh, big network, uh, one big database, I'm sorry, where we can uh, draw uh, our uh, data from. 
And uh, this is uh, one of the main achievements, I think, in EscapeNet, in addition to having the network, of course. And this is something that we cherish and, and try to uh, sustain into the future. In addition, we have other partners, as indicated here, who do a specific jobs, such as DNA analysis, database building, also a, a cost effectiveness study and pharmacology studies. And as, as indicated, uh, both the ERC and the European Heart Rhythm Association are partners in it. So the output so far has been uh, quite nice, I think. So we have uh, published uh, 63 papers so far, um, and also, uh, th well, 39 papers of the of various EscapeNet investigators uh, have been cited uh, in the newest ERC guidelines across all sections of the guidelines. I must also say I'm very happy with that. And this is this ranges from pure resuscitation science to um, uh, humanities, if I may, uh, ethics uh, 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 discussions. So I'm, I'm, um, this reflects, uh, as I indicated at the beginning, the very broad scope that we have in EscapeNet. And I'd like to invite all of you to join um, the EscapeNet session. We have a session later on this afternoon uh, where we will be um, um, presenting some highlights from the uh, recent years of, of, of our uh, achievements. And uh, at, um, uh, I'd like to invite all of you uh, to, to join us there. And I'm, of course, I'm very happy that we have the opportunity uh, given up to us by ERC to, to do this. Um, well, I have, uh, well, this is also one of the presentations that I personally will uh, present later on, but for the sake of time, I will skip this for now. So this is another reason for you to, to join the EscapeNet session later on. Uh, so this is the specific uh, section that um, I will discuss. Um, but then, so the last uh, few minutes of, of my uh, presentation now at this session, I'd like to spend on another project, uh, which is also a European funded project with this uh, sort of an, uh, a spin off of the EscapeNet project. It's, it's called the PARC project. It's funded by the uh, European Commission COST program. And this is specifically uh, intended to uh, sustain and even expand the uh, EscapeNet or the Psychiatric Rest Investigator uh, network. And this applies both to research citation science and again to the uh, sort of cardiology science, the pathophysiology uh, and biology of cardiac arrest science. Uh, this project has started only very recently, last November in fact, it's a four-year project um, and um, um, the uh, the objectives can be found on the website where um, uh, you can see the, the um, uh, internet uh, address of at the, at the bottom of this uh, page. So please uh, uh, browse on that site. And, and if you do um, uh, find it interesting, please, please let us know so uh, we can, you can join this network as well. Um, oh yeah, so I, I walked through this uh, already. Um, yeah, so I think with that, um, I uh, like to take your questions um, and I look into the Slido um, interface to see hopefully it works. Um, I have not found any questions yet. I agree, Hanno. There are no questions according to my yes. view on Slido too. Many greetings and best wishes and good luck wishes okay. from all around the world. So yes. maybe we will receive further questions to you. I think this is a very impressive start and introduction to this ERC Research Net session part one. Thank you very much for inviting us for the Escape Net session, which is today. And thank you very much for presenting us this great network and including the future plans that you have within and with this network and in collaboration with the European Resuscitation Council. So I'm looking back to Slido. I think there are no questions to you right now at this given moment. So thank you very much. Applause to you. And I will give over to um, Gavin now. So many thanks, uh, Bernd, and thank you, Hanno, for an uh, outstanding presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Wolfgang West, who's going to talk to us about video-assisted CPR, the influence of video resolution and camera position on CPR quality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Wolfgang Wetsch. I'm working with Bernd Pettiger at the University of Cologne. 
I'm a consultant of anesthesia and intensive care, and I um, did present you some data on a project um, which was called Emergency Eye, which uh, was about um, the possibility of life, um, of, of uh, transmitting a live stream from the point of incident. And Frances, can you please uh, share my slides? Yeah, next please. I've got no conflicts of interest. Um, the, the projects were uh, funded by the European Union, but I've got no conflicts with any industrial partner. Next please. There are typical problems in every emergency call and especially with the TCPR. One of the biggest problems uh, that is known in each emergency call is the recognition of the cardiac arrest by the lay person. It seems very hard for a lay person uh, to, to recognize that the person who's, who's laying down is really in cardiac arrest. And another typical problem that came out in studies dealing with TCPR is that the dispatcher does simply not know what the lay person is doing. Um, you know that there are two persons, one with a medical background and one with a non-medical background, and they're often talking two different languages and the one does sometimes not do what the other uh, wants him to do. Next, please. With the Emergency I project, we were able to show that video assisted CPR is already technically feasible and can be, imp and can be implemented into actual emergency dispatching software. And um, it is feasible to transmit a live video stream from the from the place of an incident uh, into the EMS dispatch center. Next, please. When you look at all the studies that have been published yet on VCPR, you will see that there's a lot of confusion because VCPR is not standardized at all. There are some older studies with um, very early generations of smartphones using lowest video resolutions. Um, there are some studies with new products like uh, with the iPhone 12 that is capable of transmitting um, a full HD. So what I'm going to show you is um, a little, two little studies that we did there. These are preliminary results that are not published yet. In the one um, we did um, make videos with different resolutions. And next slide, please. Which is one with a very low resolution uh, which would be about the first generation of mobile phones, one with a medium resolution and one with full HD resolution. And we did um, implement some typical mistakes that are often made during CPR, like a low or to high compression rate, an increased compression depth, a superficial compression depth, a wrong hand position, or incomplete release of the thorax. And next slide, please. And as you can see, um, that was very astonishing for us. It does not really matter um, how good the res resolution is. Um, we did show these videos to almost 100 EMS dispatchers and asked them uh, to find the mistake shown in the video. And with a high quality, 77% were able to find the correct and identify the correct mistake. And with a low video resolution, it was 71.5%. Um, so this was not statistically significant. Um, next slide, please. Another aspect on VCPR that has uh, not been paid much attention is that the, uh, the, inf uh, the position of the camera may have a big influence on uh, the ability to find and to discover um, mistakes shown in the CPR. So what we did here was we chose three camera positions, one at the foot of the victim, one at the side of the victim, and one at the head of the victim. And we implemented the same mistakes again and showed it to almost 100 dispatchers. And next slide, please. And as you, yeah, and as you can see um, from the head position, 73% um, were able to recognize and uh, correctly identify the mistake. From a side position, it was a little bit above 80%. And from the foot position, it was below 70%. So that was a significant difference from uh, side to foot position. Yeah, next slide, please. 
this is a one of the, one of these new projects um, of this great technology that could be implemented. It is still in uh, well, it's it's not fully implemented in Germany. There are some first areas that have started to using these technologies about um, three to four months ago, and we still have no data from these regions. But it is a promising technology that could help to save lives. Thank you. So thank you very much for a, a great presentation. I think we we've, uh, don't have any questions in Slido, but if maybe I could ask one quick question. Um, it, it's great to see um, that the uh, in, in your city and country, um, how feasible is this live streaming of, of video uh, material from the scene to the caller, to the call center? Well, it seems to be really feasible. We tested it in the city center of Cologne with one uh, mobile network and it, it worked absolutely great. We haven't tested it in much rural areas, but there are, there are I, I would say, about um, 10 uh, 10 EMS centers that have started using this technology in real life. So it seems it seems to be really feasible. Great, no, that, that's, that's terrific. So th thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Sabine. In, in doing so, I'm, I'm going to invite Hanno to just have a quick look at the chat as I think there's a question in there for him if, if you were able to uh, re reply to that. Uh, thank you, Sabine. Yes, uh, I'll see if I can find the, the question, okay. Okay, so our next speakers are actually two of them are Professor Jan Thorsten Gresner and Professor Jan Dent, who are going to talk about Eureka 2 and give an update and some uh, specific group analysis. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Sabine. Can I have the uh, first slides? Welcome to everybody and uh, sorry for the delay. We have been in another section um, in the presentation, but it was uh, yeah, really worth that delay. We have been in the epidemiology section um, presentation, and this is a new chapter and the new guidelines. And I hope someone from the technic staff can find our presentation and start it. Otherwise, we can also share it from here. Okay. Sabina, what's the typical way? Should, uh, Are you able to start a presentation? I can start my presentation here, yeah, no problem. Okay. We can do it from here, no problem. If I can share my screen, sorry for that. Okay, can, okay. You, can you see the presentation? Okay, sorry, I thought that the colleagues would present. Yes, Eureka Network, and why I'm talking about the epidemiology chapter, it was a great pleasure to see a lot of people coming uh, from the Eureka Network were involved in that new guideline chapter about epidemiology. I will start with some uh, slides and talking about our network and um, the network of Eureka. And you maybe remember the um, pictures and the graphs from the last years is still growing. So we have uh, more and more countries contributing. This is only one thing, but more important is that within the countries, we have more and more systems, EMS systems that are contributing to registries. So um, the uh, overall um, data collection number is increasing and we are really, really proud um, that this is feasible. And um, yeah, what about networking? And I think a lot of you have uh, also been informed and some of you participated in that international platform. So we are expanding our Eureka network to other registries all over the world. And this is uh, a picture from a conference and web conference, of course, last year in October, where we had the colleagues from um, uh, Australia and New Zealand from Paris, um, so the Pain Asian Registry and also from CARES. So more or less all the worldwide active registries um, were more, yeah, working and start working together. And I think this is a great chance for expanding our network, also the ERC Research Network. And we have the chance that we as the Eureka and the ERC part in that worldwide group, learning from the others and also um, yeah, giving maybe some information um, from our 70, 20, uh, 70, 20 uh, 27 or 29 registries to the others. So um, I think a great chance and a great collaboration. And you saw maybe some of the papers that came out 
of uh, the Eureka family and additional papers. And one of the papers um, will be presented and one of the um, latest uh, results and, and discussions will come now from Jan Venent. So I hand it over to my friend and colleague, Jan Venent. Yeah, Jan Thorsten, thank you very much. And uh, Zavin, thank you very much for the um, kind introduction and for, um, to the research net leads. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to present some of the numbers for one um, Eureka 2 uh, subgroup analysis. Uh, yeah, I have no financial conflicts of interest, um, even though I'm member of the steering committee of the German Resuscitation Registry and the study management team of Eureka 1 and Eureka 2. And I wanted to focus a bit on some numbers on bystander resuscitation, and maybe it will be um, strongly dis discussed after this, um, this short talk. Um, but we found some interesting numbers um, during our analysis of the Eureka 2 data. In total for Eureka 2, we collected 25 something thousand um, data sets on a three month period on out of hospital cardiac arrest. And bystander CPR was commenced in roughly uh, 12,500 of these cases. And we included in the subgroup analysis um, almost 5,900 um, cases of bystander CPR from respective countries where we had um, good data on um, clinical outcome, especially on outcome to hospital discharge. So, and we divided those, um, those uh, patients into groups, or so those data sets into groups, because for Eureka 2, uh, we collected data on the technology or on the on what kind of bystander CPR was done if so if bystander CPR was done. So from some, and of course, that is a limitation of this whole analysis is first, it is a registry, um, a retrospective registry um, data analysis. And we don't know for how long these different types of bystander CPR were done, but we were able for a subset of this data set to differentiate certain patients received C uh, chest compression only CPR and full CPR. Of course, it's not known uh, how the quality of full CPR was. Was there just one rescue breath given or was there proper 32-2 uh, done? But we even though don't know it for chest compression only what the, uh, what the rate and what the depth of the chest compressions were. So it's a limitation and it's um, discussed with the reviewers in the moment. So it's under revision and it's not published yet. Um, this is something on bystander CPR we already published with the Eureka 2 trial, and we matched the bystander um, different sexes, so the same sex group and the, the opposite side sex group, let's say. Um, and what we saw is that uh, in the same sex group, the distribution, the age distribution of the patient and of the bystander was usually that the patient was much older than the bystander. So we are assuming, and we don't know, if, of course, because it's retrospective data analysis, we are assuming that is a relative resuscitating or doing bystander CPR on an older relative. And the, the opposite sex group, we are assuming it's something like a linear uh, pattern here. We are um, in terms of age of uh, bystander and age of uh, patient. We are assuming that it's a couple who is uh, doing CPR on uh, his or her counterpart. But this is, I think, very interesting data. We have the opportunity in Eureka, in the Eureka network, to dive a little bit more deep in this and to get more information to strengthen um, our chain of survival. And for the chest compression only versus full CPR, um, of course, the groups are not equal distributed in terms of size. It's 1,300 for full CPR versus 4,000 uh, something for chest compression only because it's easier to teach, of course. And uh, people may be more willing to do full CPR and there may be more uh, to do uh, chest compression only CPR. And there may be more um, medical professionals who have done full CPR as a bystander. We don't know because it's a registry analysis. But what we saw is uh, in terms of ROSC, the group who received full CPR had a significant higher ROSC rate. Now you can argue it's very weak outcome point, but also when we go a little bit uh, further down and look on survival, um, we have 13% survival in the group of, who received full CPR versus 8% survival in the group of uh, the ones who received the chest compression only. 
And how was survival defined? It was defined either at uh, so, um, survival at hospital discharge or life at hospital discharge or 30 day survival, depending on what was available on the, um, on the respective registry data, because we have used not a, da um, a, a research database, but Eureka is a project run by routine data collection and by uh, quality management and quality improvement instruments. Um, yeah, um, and that's the last slide, just comparing outcomes, ROSC and survival uh, in the different groups. And what you can see here, ROSC grade, it's uh, significant higher, it's not mentioned here, but it's statistically significant higher in the group who receive full CPR versus, uh, and also um, in survival in the full CPR group versus the chest compression only CPR group, but it's not shown here is the, um, uh, it's not um, shown what, is, um, what was done in the different countries, but of course we have done this analysis for the different countries and what we've seen is that of course it depends on the system uh, where the patient was resuscitated in, whether there is a huge impact on full CPR or maybe uh, in some countries there is no or only small impact on full CPR, really depending on the EMS system. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, both of you, for this interesting presentation. Uh, for the sake of time, and I can't see any questions on the Q&A right now, um, I would ask all participants to write the questions in the Q&A box on the slider tool. Um, then the authors maybe can answer them later. So I'm going to hand over back to Bernd for the introduction of the next speaker. Thank you very much, Sabine. It's my great pleasure now to introduce to you Anna Maria Mo Österbö, and I hope I pronounced the <clears throat> name at least in a way that you can understand it by, by yourself. So you are, according to my information, the project manager mm -hmm. of the follow-up program for first aid providers in Stavanger in Norway, and you will give us a presentation on follow-up um, program for first aid providers. So welcome this session. We are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Bernd. Uh, Frances, can you start uh, my presentation, please? Here we are. Yes, and you can just uh, use the um, modes when you can just uh, show the I do not the I don't have the correct uh, the presentation mode. Thank you very much. Your presentation mode. Yeah, as Bern said, my name is Anna Mo Evstebe, and I am the project leader of the first aid provider follow-up program that we recently started here at Stavanger University Hospital in Norway. The project supervisors are Konrad Björsol and Thomas Lindner. Next slide, please. And this project is operated by the Regional Center for Emergency Medical Research and Development and receives funding from the Lauder Foundation for Acute Medicine and uh, from the Norwegian Directorate of Health. The Norwegian Directorate of Health is also a collaborator and this, sub -project, this is a sub-project in the national campaign, uh, Saving Lives Together. Next slide, please. Performing CPR can be a challenging experience, especially for lay rescuers with no medical background. Such an incident can lead to persistent adverse effects. Many struggle with guilt for providing insufficient CPR. In addition, many worry about the patient's outcome. First aid providers have no possibility of obtaining such information unless they are next of kin. A recent study conducted here at Stavanger University Hospital revealed emotional and social challenges in the individuals that were interviewed. It showed that first aid providers can experience weight loss, flashbacks, sleeping disorders and nightmares, anxiety, concentration difficulties, reduced work cap capacity, etc. Next, please. The follow-up program is offered to people who have been present or provided first aid to an unconscious person. We include lay rescuers, 
volunteer first aid providers and healthcare personnel who have provided first aid outside of work. Next, please. To recruit first aid providers, uh, we have a collaboration with the EMS. Paramedics leave a sort of business card with information about the follow-up program. You can press next. Here you can see the, the card where the EMS is handing out to first aid providers. Also, we collaborate with the EMDC at our local hospital. And they're sending out uh, text messages to callers with the same information. Next, please. Here you can see the text message. In addition, we collaborate with several departments at the hospital, and we have worked extensively with exposure in the media. Next, please. The follow-up program consists of four main components. The most important component is the debrief with experienced healthcare personnel. If the first aid provider wish to know the patient's outcome, we we'll also try to obtain consent from the patient or their next of kin to reveal whether the patient has survived or not. If necessary, we we'll also discuss contagious diseases and testing and we also obtain feedback from the first aid providers. Both information about their experience of providing first aid and their experience with the EMS and EMDC. Next, please. The debriefing is in many ways similar to those used by healthcare professionals. The first aid providers are able to share their story and we acknowledge their efforts. However, and no information concerning the specific incident or the specific patients are revealed. Medical and technical questions from the first aid providers are answer, answered on a general basis. The purpose of this follow-up program is to help the first aid providers to process a difficult experience. Simultaneously, we wish to help them attain a sense of achievement despite the personal strain following such a first aid incident. Most first aid providers are not in need of a further follow-up than portrayed in this project. First aid providers are usually healthy individuals uh, who unexpectedly experience a life-threatening situation. However, if some uh, show symptoms of a psychological disorder, such as depression or suicidal thoughts, they are referred to the ordinary healthcare system for diagnosis and treatment. Next, please. As far as we know, no one has ever before organized a systematic follow-up for first aid providers as a part of the public health care system. Therefore, this is a completely new public health concept. We hope that this follow-up program will help prevent psychological strain for the first aid providers, as well as establishing positive attitudes concerning first aid within the public. We offer follow-up uh, for first aid providers from all of Norway. However, at the moment, we are only located, located at the Stavanger University Hospital. We do offer digital follow-up for those who can't come to our physical location. Uh, and we are working to establish local follow-ups in the remaining health trusts in Norway. We also hope that this follow-up program for first aid providers will be established internationally in the future. Next, please. That's all I had. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna Marie. Um, and um, we have time for maybe one brief question, but I cannot see any questions in the chat. So with this, I would like to cordially thank you very much for this, I think, very important research in, in, a, in a very new field. And this is not only research, this is also about care towards um, first aid providers. Um, maybe one, one question, what are your further wishes and plans? As I mentioned, we wish to establish this locally throughout Norway, because uh, as of now, we're only local, located here in Stavanger. We do the follow-up through themes, but we feel like a physical presence is also important in such a situation. So we uh, try to 
uh, already started collaborating with other health trusts and we wish that uh, in a few years there will be local uh, centers in all the main region of Norway that will provide such a follow-up and then of course we also uh, hope it will spread internationally and we are doing research to try to evaluate the effect of this program to make sure that it's uh, has the effects we want and uh, try to investigate more about how the first aid provider experience these incidents. Excellent. Cordial congratulations, good luck, and thank you very much. Thanks. Gavin, please. So, uh, and just to add my thanks, uh, a, a terrific presentation. So uh, it's my pleasure to now introduce the uh, the next speaker, uh, our Vice President, uh, Federico uh, Semeraro, that's going to uh, share with us his, his work on Kids Save Lives in the World, Federico. Thank you, Gavin. Hello to everybody. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you again today. I tried to share my screen. Give me one second. Can you see my slides? Yes. I think so. Okay. So first of all, uh, a cordial ciao to everybody. I, I saw a lot of a lot of uh, fans of Kids Save Life on, on the chat. So first of all, ciao to everybody. Hello to everybody. Um, I'm very proud to introduce you one of the top topic of system saving life, uh, uh, Kids Save Life in the world. This is my conflict of interest. Mainly, the only problem is uh, with me. It's uh, you know I am a geek. I'm a Star Wars, Star Trek addicted, and only intellectual conflict of interest I can say. And this is uh, the new infographic from ERC, System Saving Life. The five top messages. One of that kids save life, and I'm very proud to introduce to our new kids uh, our new chapter of System Saving Life. Uh, and Kids Save Life, it's like a Matrioska inside this new kids uh, chapter. Uh, kids Save Life as a potential tool for system to improve survival of cardiac arrest patients. Uh, this is our new uh, clinical guideline for clinical practice. All school children should routinely receive CPR training each year. And please have a look to the uh, guidelines on resuscitation and have a look to infographics. Uh, this is the, the new uh, suggestion from ERC and teach all school children to do CPR using check, cold and compress, get children to teach their parents and relatives how to do CPR and continue training in higher education, particularly for healthcare students, mandatory nationwide training for school children as the highest of most important long-term impact for improving bystander CPR rate. And also engage government and politician to uh, pass laws to mandate training school children in CPR. So a lot of key recommendation based on expert opinion. And there is a, a lot of infographic from the past and we produced the new European map of CPR education 2020 uh, about kids save life implementation. A lot of amazing awareness campaign all over the world and a lot of activities all around the world. Uh, we are very proud of it. And there is a, a very strong connection uh, with World Saturday Day between World Saturday Day and Kids Have Life campaign. So I hope after this horrible period of time after pandemia, uh, I hope we can restart with the Kids Have Life campaign, increase awareness in the school, increase uh, uh, the community approach uh, and we'll see what happens in the next months. And this is our, my take home message, uh, support and spread the word of kids of life, always wear a mask, wash your hands and stay far, far away. Thank you so much. So thank you, uh, Federico, for that uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, I'm just having a quick look at the um, uh, Slido uh, and I can't see any questions uh, uh, there. If you were to, um, you know, I guess project forward, you know, where, where, where do you think the, 
uh, the, the kids save lives, you know, concept. Where, where's where's it going next? I think in this period of time, we 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 need absolutely to restart digitally. So you know, kids are much 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 skilled than us to uh, use social media, use smartphones. So we need absolutely to restart from the technology. We need to restart. Uh, we, we will talk about in the, in the session, uh, restart course in the, uh, by IERC. So for the kids, they are absolutely able to use technology. Uh, we can use social media, we can use smartphone. Uh, I think we need absolutely uh, to restart as soon as possible with some knowledge to website, cozy, also for, for the kids with gaming and you know, virtual reality and all the, the, the stuff uh, able to increase engagement of children and kids and everybody in, in the schools. This is my point for the future. So th thank you, Federico. And, and I think just looking at the time, uh, there is a question in uh, Slido now, so I, I will put it to you. What, what are the steps to implement the intervention in schools if the legislation is already there in the country? Is there a guide to follow? Yes, I think uh, I'll give you an example in Italy. When uh, a lot of countries in Europe uh, receive some law uh, on, on, school, on school children, on school children training, we give our government an example. In Europe exists a law about school children training and similar happened to UK. You arrive after Italy, an example of law in Europe is a good example of collaboration or network in Europe and in the world. If you have a law, you can implement, you can put all this content in the core curriculum of the student. I think we, we need to push hard and fast on our government to create a law in every European country. So push hard and fast, not only on the chest, but also on the government. I think that's an excellent uh, message to, to conclude uh, your talk. Uh, thank you. I'm going to hand back to my co-chair, Sabine. Thank you. Thank you. It is my great pressure now to uh, introduce our last presenter today, Anastasis Stefanakis who is an active course director and instructor of the ERC and also a strong supporter of the Kids Life, Saves Life um, Foundation. So he's going to do a talk today about the Life Force project and I'm very happy to have you here. The floor is yours, Anastasia. Thank you, Sabine. Frances, can uh, we see the slides, please? I wish a great afternoon to the moderators and participants of this session. My name is Anastasia Stefanakis, and I am the president of the Hellenic humanitarian organization Kids Save Lives Ta Pedia Sozun Zoes. Today, on the anniversary of Greek Independence Day, I am proud to present to you Project Life Force, its origins, its contents, and the expected outcome and goals. Next slide, please. As stated in the slide, I have no conflict of interest to declare. Next slide, please. It is a well-known fact that out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is the third leading cause of death in industrialized countries. In Europe, it affects over 350,000 people annually. Next slide, please. 100,000 of those people could be saved if they received CPR in the first two, three minutes. This means that CPR would have to be provided by bystanders who are likely to be on the scene first. Next slide, please. The realistic and sustainable solution to this problem is to train a sufficient portion of the general population, roughly 15%. The most suitable group to initiate training are school children, whose main activity is learning and who readily absorb new knowledge and skills. Next slide, please. In 2010, while working as an EMT in Halkidiki in Northern Greece, I began training children in first aid in local schools. Next slide, please. In 2012, I attempted to teach CPR to school children younger than 10 years old using the existing ERC methods. It was soon evident that those methods were not suitable for that age. Next slide, please. In 2015, the Kids Save Lives ERC position statement on school children education in CPR endorsed by the World Health Organization. 
suggested training pupils 12 years old or younger in CPR in all schools. Next slide, please. In 2016, the humanitarian organization Kids Save Lives, Τα Παιδιά Σώζουν Ζωές, was founded to train pupils in CPR in all Greek schools in cooperation with Hellenic Society of Emergency Pre-Hospital Care. 826 volunteer ERC BLS school instructors deliver the training. Next slide, please. In 2017, Kids Save Lives Τα Παιδιά Σώζουν Ζωές was endorsed by the Ministry of Education as national program, and it, and it has voluntarily trained more than 65,000 pupils in 643 schools across Greece. Next slide, please. In 2018, having identified the need to create a suitable methodology and tools to train younger children in CPR and first aid, I asked ERC instructor and member of Kids Save Lives, Ms. Paschalina Jani, to conduct a preliminary investigation. Fellow ERC instructors and members of Kids Save Lives, Ms. Sevastiet Mekchoglu and Mr. Theodoros Kalivas, researched and formulated the proposed life force methodology and tools and wrote a funding proposal. Next slide, please. In 2020, the proposal was successfully submitted under Erasmus Plus Key Action 2 and was approved. Next slide, please. To implement life force, a multidisciplinary consortium was formed, comprising physicians, pedagogists, speech therapists, psychologists, music educators, application developers, and other experts. It includes University of Thessaly, project leader, University Clean Cologne, team led by Professor Ben Bettiger, Italian Resuscitation Council, team led by Dr. Federico Semeraro, Hellenic Society of Emergency Pre-Hospital Care, team led by Dr. Kostandinos Fortunis, European University of Cyprus, under the guidance of Dr. Marius Georgiou, and Kids Save Lives Τα Παιδιά Σόζου Ζωές. Project Life Force involves the development of a learning methodology. Next slide, please. Educational tools and e-learning environment to pre-train pupils aged six to 10 years old in elements of CPR, using fun, innovative, learning by doing activities to prepare them for proper CPR training later on. The project will be implemented in five phases. First phase, this intellectual output focused on the educational system in European countries with special attention to curriculum elements that were relevant to life force. Second phase, this output will create a new modified BLS algorithm and break it down into basic cognitive and perceptual skills, introducing an innovative approach to pre-trained school children. Third phase, this output will provide the educational material which will include a handbook, music games, songs, educational videos, questionnaires, brain box style cards, etc. Skill visualization and sequential representation will facilitate the recall of the new algorithm, helping pupils to retain the skills for longer. Fourth phase, this output will develop training the trainer's material, which will involve informal learning practices. It will also help the trainers to be able to apply this knowledge and skills to other environments. And the last phase, this, this output involves the creation of an open educational resources e-platform. It will be the main tool for operating the online courses for training the trainers. It also involves the electronic interactive version of the Life Force alphabet and an interactive application for the pupils. Next slide, please. A series of events and activities will demonstrate the project outputs and impact to school children and teachers, as well as head teachers, parents, pedagogists, stakeholders, and policy makers on local, national, and European level. The project outputs and results will be disseminated through a series of social and cultural events, conferences, and publications to, pro to promote sustainability and to ensure that it will reach the maximum number of interesting parties. Pilot implementation of the project will be carried out in elementary school schools in the four participating countries. Next slide, please. The main deliverables will be 
the new life force algorithm, the education material, tools to train the pupils, and the e-learning platform. Next slide, please. The goals and long-term plans of the project are to demonstrate the effectiveness of pre-training of six to 10 year old in CPR, to campaign for inclusion of CPR first aid training in the national curricula across Europe, to raise awareness regarding the importance of teaching CPR to the general population, and making installation of AEDs in all public, public places mandatory. Finally, it will also cultivate the ideals of solidarity and volunteering and will promote a culture of prevention, well-being and healthy lifestyle across, Greece, uh, across Europe. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention and interest. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you very much, Anastasis, for this great presentation. You also received some praise in the chat. Um, as we discussed before, Anastasis prefers to answer all the questions in written form in the chat. Just have a look in there. There was one small question in there. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Gavin, who is going to share the last part of this session, the ERC Research Net plans and perspectives. Yes, so, so um, th th thank you to all of the presenters for their um, amazing presentations. And, and I guess rather than uh, he hearing my voice, um, I I'd be keen uh, to hear the, the, the thoughts and views of the, the panel assembled here. Where, where do you think uh, the ERC Research Net should, uh, should go next? Um, I, I wonder, Hanno, would, would, would you be willing to maybe kick off the discussion? Sure. Um, thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm also very uh, delighted to have seen all these uh, beautiful presentations and also very, uh, what, what I like personally very much is the fact that it is also comprehensive. It, it covers all areas, uh, not only the, well, pure science, but also the behavior, also the, the impact on, 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 um, on rescuers. So, um, well, all I can say is that we should um, try to maintain this uh, this momentum. Um, I think the uh, collaboration has not only proven very successful, but in my opinion, at least, has been a very, very, very pleasurable one. Uh, so let's keep the momentum going. And um, I think we now um, also have uh, sort of a, a consortium or a network, if you will, which has sufficient size, uh, to, to, which has maybe gained the critical mass, uh, if I may say so. So uh, it's all it's up to all of us and not only the, the the panel members but all of us in the network to to look out for ways in which we can continue this and I think this um, this is the only thing I can say about this. Yeah, no, th th thank you. And um, I, I think you know to you know reach out to people participating in the session and get them to put comments into the Slido chat so that uh, we can uh, uh, respond to them uh, there and, and, and potentially discuss. Um, it was great to hear from Jess and the uh, ERC uh, young team. Um, you, you've already alluded to some of the areas where you, you look to future collaboration you know, with the research net. You know, if you were to pick out one or two things, you know, what do you think the areas of the, the, the greatest potential uh, are from your perspective? In terms of the, the collaborations, I think really is building on that buddy system and that networking and giving the, the younger, more junior researchers that step up into the world of resuscitation. I think it's easier once you're already established to get involved in projects. Um, but I think that's where we could really work with them is on helping them get those first initial contacts and having those opportunities to get involved to kickstart their careers. Terrific. And, and one of the major successes um, of, of this collaboration is the Eureka Network, uh, led by Jan Thorsten. Um, you know, Jan, Jan, what do you see the future looking like? Again, thank you very much. And I think uh, what we have learned today and during the last uh, months and weeks that this collaboration and this uh, learning from each other and to see what others are doing is very, very important. And Hanno has uh, some projects that are directly comparable. And so I think the ResearchNet has a great chance to bring all these different um, 
um, research projects and ERC projects like Eureka together. And it's a great platform to um, interact and to learn from each other what is, um, what is going on. So there are a lot of papers out of on the market every day. You can't read them all. And in this network, we have the chance to um, see really what's happening within the ERC. So great platform, great idea. And I think we have to continue this. Thank you. And um, but Bernd, um, your your reflections on the, the the session and the you know the message for you like where you'd like to see the network move going forwards. Well, thank you very much. I first of all I have to say that I'm really proud of what we have achieved together over the last eight years. This is just great, and I'm extremely thankful to all more than 200 members of the research net and most of them have participated very actively in many different ways. So my cordial thanks to all members and I, I'm sure that we can proceed um, in, within this network. And we have seen that we have so many topics and ideas and projects where we really can work together. And that is the idea of the ERC research network that we work together in Europe and maybe beyond over national borders. And I think we have seen it in this session today, we will have the next, the second part of the ERC research net session tomorrow morning at this Congress at 10 o'clock AM and I'm, sure that we will further proceed in all of the project that we have heard and um, registries is one important thing and um, for me one of the most important things is all these european funded things these are really amazing um, because we further need to get money from european institutions for our our research I would like to bring in again back in our attention that cardiac arrest and maybe despite the coronavirus and COVID-19, cardiac arrest is still the third leading cause of death in Europe and in all civilized nations, which is probably still more death than by COVID-19. We are putting a lot of money in COVID-19 research, which is justified in my eyes. And I would be happy if we got at least part of this money also into resuscitation, cardiac arrest and post cardiac arrest care research. And that is one major um, action and activity for the next years to come, I, I think. So thank you very much Bert, for sharing those uh, insights. And uh, again, for the you know huge amount that we're indebted to the formation of the, uh, the, the network and bringing it to where it is at the moment. We've got one or two minutes uh, left. Are there any other members of the uh, panel that would like to share any insights? If I can, Gavin. Please, Federico. Yeah, if we can summarize in some way the, the dreams for the future, I can say as a hashtag network, collaboration, uh, James session through the several network and we have to look into the other scientific society to find uh, some extra collaboration with them uh, we we need a new orchestra with new new singer uh, so the the mantra for the future is to collaborate hashtag as soon as possible after covid19 thank you so thank you, Federico. And I think those are some, some great words for us to uh, fit, finish this session. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the uh, presenters, uh, my co-chair Sabine uh, and, and Bernd uh, for so expertly helping keep the session to, to time. I think it's been uh, terrific. Uh, and I'd like to wish you all well uh, in the rest of the day and the, the, the rest of the conference and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, stay safe. All the best. Great.